I've taken the time to study the all 22 coaches film from the Buffalo Bills week five loss to the Houston Texans. And I'm sharing my top takeaways with you today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Well, folks, welcome in. Excited to break down what the All Twenty Two film revealed to me in studying it all day on Monday. And some people ask me, Joe, how could you do that? How could you relive the game? especially a disappointing performance like that, to which I would say it's where the answers are. Like if you want the answers, it's not sitting on social media and getting in Twitter fights with people over what you think is the most important thing. There's a lot of things that need to be fixed and improved upon, and the answers are all right there in the film. And so I like to go get the answers, and I'm excited to share what I've learned with you Today, I want to spend time talking about the passing offense, the run game, a little bit of the end of game sequencing now that we've had a chance to study the tape and also listen to the coaches on it. We'll talk defense, studs and duds, snap counts, the things that we do here on the All-22 Review. But let's start with asking ourselves the question, what's up with the passing game? And Josh Allen was 9 of 30. That's crazy. 9 of 30 in the year 2024. That's bad for rookie year, Josh Allen. I don't care what receivers he does or does not have. Nine of 30 is crazy to me. And so, as is always the case in football, it's not just one thing. There's a lot of things that are not clicking right now. But I do want to start by being very specific to this game against the Houston Texans. I thought conceptually, now stick with me here, because I don't want you to get mad. Conceptually, the game plan for the Bills on offense was fine. Conceptually, it was fine. You knew the defensive structure you were going to get against Houston. You've heard me say this over and over again because it matters a lot. Houston runs one high, middle of the field, closed coverage, which means you throw the ball outside to the perimeter, and your wide receivers have to win one-on-one battles. The right game plan for that structure is vertical passing, and it is targeting your wide receivers on the perimeter. The Bills had the right idea. The problem is the Bills don't have the personnel to really take advantage of making Houston pay for playing that type of defense. You should throw it deep. You should throw it outside the numbers. But when you don't have the receiver talent, and there's just chemistry issues galore with your quarterback and his new weapons, it's just not a great opportunity to take advantage of what that defense gives you. Josh Allen, 0 for 6 on throws 20 yards or more down the field, 1 for 8 on throws 10 to 19 yards down the field. 12.5 air yards per attempt. That's the most Josh Allen's averaged in a game since 2023. What's hard for me to reconcile about what I'm seeing from this passing game really over the last two weeks, especially against Houston, is what I saw from the passing game in the first three weeks of the season. You talk to me about quality of opponent or whatever. I don't think it particularly matters. The process for how Josh Allen was playing the game, fundamentally different in those first three weeks compared to what we've seen the last two, especially against Houston. 
in the first three games, you heard me rave about Josh Allen and how he was playing the game, the decision-making, taking the easy throws, taking checkdowns, getting yards after catch, taking profits, uh, taking advantage of the easy button throws built in by Joe Brady. And that has just evaporated very, very quickly. Did Josh Allen get bored with that? He said he has in the past. He said, I can't get bored with the short stuff. It certainly feels like he did. Now, like I said, the game plan conceptually was fine. If you have the wide receiver talent to make them pay for playing that type of coverage structure. But as I studied the tape, it became clear to me that there's just a lack of cohesion between Josh and the receivers. When you're throwing the ball down the field, the things that takes the most chemistry imaginable to be successful at, it's a low, it's a low efficiency play to begin with, right? Throwing the ball vertically, low efficiency no matter what. But doing so with not good down the field receiving talent coupled with new, right, just not time on task, the chemistry is clearly not there. It's a recipe for inefficiency. Why are you in third and longs all the time? Well, that's part of it. And so you have lack of cohesion between Josh and his receivers down the field, and you have protection issues as well. And again, I can't stop saying this enough. Protection issues are not just an offensive line thing. There were certainly some L's that the offensive line took. Osiris Torrance took a bad L. David Edwards on the play. Josh Allen got hurt. He took a bad L. Spencer Brown took a bad L. That happened. But bigger than that is the protection plan. And you have an instance where they're going to blitz the slot corner. They're showing that they're going to blitz it. And nobody, nobody seems to be aware of this. That slot corner is lined up over Curtis Samuel, who just runs by him and, and runs a vertical seam route. Ray Davis is the offset back to that side. He doesn't even pay that blitzer no attention. He just goes out for a a swing route. Meanwhile, Josh Allen's eyes are to the other side of the field. He never sees it pre-snap. This is the stuff I'm talking about. That has got nothing to do with an offensive lineman. It's an overload pressure. There's an unaccounted player. It's a free runner. If that back's not going to stay in to protect, which he didn't. They have to become more cohesive on these things. It's a microcosm of of multiple things that happen just like that. And we cannot just diminish that Khalil Shakir didn't play in this game. He is clearly the most important weapon in this passing game for the Bills. If the Bills need a bucket, Khalil Shakir is the guy that they can ask to get open and catch the ball. And in a game where your wide receiver talent was extremely important based on the defensive structure, You didn't have your best one. You didn't have your best one. And so go ahead and and if you want it to be about Curtis Samuel or Dawson Knox, those seem to be two popular victims in the Bills social media world today. All right. To me, I split it four ways. Play calling, Josh Allen's decision-making, pass protection, and wide receiver talent. I think it's all four of those. And you can convince me that it's probably close to a 25-25-25-25 ratio in terms of what I think is the most important thing. I think it's very close amongst all of that. And Josh Allen is not without fault for the way that this offensive passing game is looking right now. I know nobody ever wants to blame Josh Allen for anything. And if something doesn't go right for Josh Allen, you find any reason in the world to point it at anything else that's not Josh Allen. Oh, he doesn't trust the receivers. Oh, the play design was bad. Oh, they can't scheme guys wide open. Oh, the protection, he doesn't trust it. Like Sometimes Josh Allen just has to make a better decision. Sometimes Josh Allen has to make a better throw. And I know nobody wants to ever acknowledge or hear that, but Josh Allen has his share of culpability for this as well. Look at the first drive of the game. And I sent this, the All-22 Review film clips, I must have had, I think, almost 40 clips in there where I'm breaking this stuff down, showing people exactly what I'm talking about. And if you're part of the subtext community or the Substack, you get into the film clips, right? So if you want these film clips yourself, join the Substack, join the subtext. There's a link in today's show notes. But you're looking right at the first play of the game, the first pass, the first pass of the game. 
motion. Everybody wants motion. Curtis Samuel motion. This is after a, what, a seven yard run by James Cook on first down. Curtis Samuel motion, play action fake. Oh, wow. We got all the cool stuff, play action and motion. And the Bills are working a switch release to Josh Allen's left between Matt Collins and Curtis Samuel, or excuse me, Matt Collins and Keon Coleman. And they're trying to get a rub and they don't really get a rub. And so Matt Collins is trying to release around that corner is in his hip pocket. It's tight coverage. Josh Allen's got to take his eyes off of that immediately and work to his number two, which I would think is Curtis Samuel on a flare route or his number three, which I would think is Dalton Kincaid, who's wide open over the middle of the field. Instead, he stays locked on that switch release that never uncovers and throws an uncatchable ball out of bounds. He had two options open, and that's just an example of one play where I thought, hey, this was on Josh Allen. Get your eyes off of that read. It's not there. When they got all hung up on the rub, get your eyes off it. There's a lot of examples of that, too. There's a lot of examples of protection issues. There's a lot of examples of guys not being able to uncover. It's all that stuff. And it's becoming abundantly clear to me that the time on task that these players don't have with Josh Allen is costing them right now. But also, what makes it hard is you showed us, in for three weeks, you showed us everything I ever dreamed of this Bill's passing offense being. And you got away from it. So the truth is always somewhere in the middle. Never as bad as you think, never as good as you think. It's always kind of somewhere in the middle. But I think there's clear issues here that I I worry that some of it can be fixed. Like I, I worry that you just don't have enough good receivers and you probably need to make a move there. Like until that happens, I I worry that you're going to be struggling regularly with that type of the cop that piece of the conversation. You can get better at protection schemes. Josh Allen can make better decisions. Your play calling sequency can improve. So I think you have a path to improve a lot of this stuff. And I think the reality is, I mean, it, it's week five. It's still early in the season. You remember Tom Brady in the Super Bowl run with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? They started seven and five, and really it wasn't clicking, and then it did. Like that's it can still happen. Who's really playing great football right now? The Vikings? The Commanders? I got Ravens are looking pretty good. There's not a whole lot of like teams out there just playing great football right now. So it's okay, but the tease of weeks one through three is what really makes it difficult for me. Maybe this is that lull. There's always been a lull. Every year under McDermott, there's a lull. Maybe this is it. Maybe you got to have to go through this and, and learn some hard lessons and come out the other side playing better football. It's not important to be playing your best football in week four and week five. Like I get that. But these games certainly count, and you just lost tiebreakers to the Texans and the Ravens, two teams that are probably going to win their divisions. And let's face it, AFC East doesn't look too good. Dolphins and Patriots look terrible. The Jets look like they're about as average as it can be, maybe below average. The Bills are the four seed, right, Like, or they're the division winner. Those are going to be important tiebreakers that they're going to want to have if they can get there. There's a long road ahead, and there's clear paths to getting better at this stuff. And you can certainly get more out of Curtis Samuel. You can get more out of Dawson Knox, and that's what makes me excited about where this offense can go is because there's so much meat on the bone. There's nowhere to go but up, it seems. Now they got to figure it out. Now they got to figure it out. All right, I spent way more time on that than I thought I would. On the other side of it, I want to talk about the run game, end of game sequence, offensive snap counts, and then, of course, we'll get into the defense and studs and duds. Folks, be sure to stick with me. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com to download America's number one sportsbook. Time is our most precious commodity, so don't waste it scrolling through the same mind-numbing content for hours and hours. How can you spend it wisely to improve yourself? Our sponsor, Hillsdale College, is offering more than 40 free, that's right, free online courses, including Constitution 101, Introduction to Free Market Economics, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Republic, and a brand new documentary style course on Marxism, Socialism, and Communism. All on Hillsdale's course, all of Hillsdale's courses are self paced, so you can start whenever you would like to and you can tune in wherever. Plus, you can go deeper with readings, quizzes, discussions or just enjoy the lectures. 
Go right now to hillsdale.edu slash locked on to enroll. There's no cost and it's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash locked on to register. Hillsdale.edu slash locked on. Let's talk about the run game. I think the Bills' run game's pretty good. I think the run concepts are good. I think James Cook's a good running back. I think his vision is looking really good this year. Got that slashing style. He's It's been good. The problem is the sequencing and the play calls. The Bills had 25 first down plays against the Houston Texans. They ran it 19 times. 19 of 26 first down snaps were runs. That's way too predictable, folks. They've got to mix in the run game more effectively. I want the Bills to run the ball. It's it's an important part of what they need to be offensively. To be the best version of themselves, they have to run the ball consistently and effectively. But how you're mixing that in, quite honestly, is terrible right now. 25 first down snaps, 19 runs. It's insane. You have to be able to mix that in more consistently. Let's talk about the end of game. Had a lot of time to think about this. When I'd say end of game, I mean 32 seconds left, what the Bills did pinned back against their own goal line. Hindsight's 20-20. The Bills needed to get a first down. Josh Allen's your best player. I'd have been disappointed if Josh Allen didn't have an opportunity to be part of getting that first down. My issue is how they got there. You start off with two throws down the field. You haven't had anything going down the field all game long. And so you dial up one to Coleman and one to Hollins. What? You you just needed to be efficient and get a first down. So let's talk about those three plays. First down, they throw a back shoulder to Keon Coleman. The problem with the play, obviously low efficiency play to begin with. But about three steps into the release, Keon Coleman is looking for the ball. And as soon as his head goes to the ball, so does the corner's eyes go to the ball. In order for a back shoulder throw to be effective, you have to push vertical. You have to sell the vertical route so that you can stop and catch the ball. You don't sit there and just start running and looking for the ball. It's a terrible route. Push vertical. It has to feel like a go route so you can stop and catch the ball. And Keon Coleman, three steps in, he's like so excited that the ball is going to come to him. And he's not, he doesn't have good technique on the play. Happened multiple times with Keon Coleman in this game. The ball that hit him in the head. He's the only plant person on the planet that didn't know it was a glance route to him. It's the only option on the play. They get the exact look they want. The only person that doesn't know that the ball is going to him is Keon Coleman, the guy that the ball hits in the head. I have another situation where it's a it's a deep out route and he just rounds the the release, rounds the break right into the corner and it becomes a contested throw. So there's like so much work needed for Keon Coleman. And they went to him in a high leverage situation. Second down, you get the stutter go to Mac Hollins. So no, it, it winds up being open. But they haven't been able to connect all year on a deep throw. That wasn't the time to think it was going to happen for the first time. You needed to be efficient and get the first down. Then on third down, you get a good look. Curtis Samuels comes open in the middle of the field. Josh Allen has pressure from his left. He can't get set. Doesn't put enough on the throw. It one hops in front of Curtis Samuel. But, like, any one of those things goes correctly, and, well, the Bills get through it, and they go to overtime, and we see what happens. I don't have an issue with throwing the ball. You need to get a first down. I like the idea of, of Josh Allen having the ball in his hands. Certainly a, a great argument for running the ball and like maybe you get a little bit of space and that punts a little bit further and you take time off. I get that too. I get that too. You had to get a first down. I really don't take exception with it being the idea that Josh Allen's going to throw the ball and we're going to get the yards. But the, the the exception that I take is vertical shots? You hadn't hit vertical shots all year. It wasn't the time for that. Let's talk offensive snap counts. And I put a poll out to the Discord channel. 
if you guys want total snaps or percentage of snaps, percentage of snaps won convincingly. So we will have percentage of snaps moving forward for this part of the All-22 review. 61 offensive snaps, Josh Allen, 98%, Mitch Trubisky, 2%. At running back, Cook, 90, excuse me, Cook, 59%. Ty Johnson, 21%. Ray Davis, 3%. You can see that his workload is going down. Ty Johnson is being able to really step up in pass protection, and he's had some good plays as a runner and a receiver. So the Ray Davis market share conversation very much on hold. Reggie Gilliam, 8%. Dalton Kincaid at tight end, 62%. Dawson Knox, 33%. Q Morris, 7%. Alec Anderson, 28%. At receiver, Coleman, 62%. Curtis Samuel, 56%. Mac Hollins, 54%. MVS, 46%. Tyrell Shavers, 26%. And then all five of your starters on the offensive line played 100% of the snaps. You know, let's, I think a microcosm of the, of the game, another microcosm. I feel like I've had a few of those already. Third and nine, fourth quarter, you need to score. And they they isolate Marquez Valdez-Scantling against Derek Stingley for a comeback route at the sticks. And that went exactly how you thought it would. That's what, in a high leverage moment in the game, that's what you're looking to get done. High leverage moment in the game, you're looking to get done a back shoulder throw to Keon Coleman pinned up against your own end zone. The menu is not great, folks. The menu is just not great. The two best passing plays in the game, the check down to James Cook, play action, check down to James Cook, makes one guy miss, gets like 14 yards, and the Keon Coleman touchdown. A little comeback route thrown with great anticipation, shake the one tackler, sprint for a touchdown. Quick, easy throws. The best two plays you had in the passing game all game long. I guess another one, Kincaid over the middle, Second window throw. That was a good, that was a really good play. And actually, he worked the progression very well. I think he had Samuel initially on kind of a sit route. And then he he his eyes go to the second level, gets a second window throw to Kincaid, sets up the eventual James Cook rushing touchdown. So those are your three best passing plays, but two of them just, just take the free access and get some yards after the catch, man. All right. On the other side of it, we're talking defense, defensive snap counts, studs and duds. Folks, be sure to stick with me. Purchasing tickets for an event can be stressful, but it doesn't have to be, and it isn't if you have game time. Game time is the fast and easy way to purchase tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. The app is awesome. It's easy to navigate. You can get flash deals. You get a seat view. When you buy tickets, they go straight to your phone, so you don't have to dig through emails. So many things that I love. You can also turn on all-in pricing to get you know, the, the all-in price from the outset, and I love this, they give you a great deal on last-minute tickets. You don't always know if you can go to an event, right? I mean, there's concerts being in, in announced, there's hockey games, things that I want to get to, the basketball games. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go in February, but on game time, I can make that choice right up until the day of the event and get a great deal on tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? It's game time. Let's talk about the defense here. I don't have as much to say about the defense. I certainly watched it. I think defense came down to they had two bad drives. I thought the defense rose to the occasion, made game-changing plays, overcame a ton of injuries, they had two, two bad drives. And I think Cole Bishop was the problem on both of them. He, uh, well, I, I, you go back to that that first touchdown drive, and the Bills had him in a third and five. They had him in a third and five, and they Houston leaks leaks the back out, and the Bills have two in coverage to defend those three because they're they're sending five. The Bills blitzes and, and pressure looks were were not very effective. I'll say that. I think CJ Stroud was like nine of ten against the blitz. It was pretty easy for them to deal with their, their ability to handle protection schemes much better than the Buffalo bills. Um, but anyways, they get two defenders with three in routes. They just throw it to the back. They get a big chunk gain and the bills had them in a third and five. And then they rip off four plays in a row, including a missed tackle from Cole Bishop on Nico Collins to give them 11 yards. And then you have two plays in a row where you get gashed in the run game and they score a touchdown. But then obviously 
the the Cole Bishop, uh, the the Nico Collins uh, touchdown, sixty seven yard touchdown. That wasn't hard to figure out when you watched it live. It's cover three. He's a deep middle defender. He buzzes down for no reason. He's flat footed. Nico Collins gets free down the field and scores a touchdown. Those were your two drives. Everything else from the defense you can absolutely live with, including some major, major um, game-changing plays. Terrell Bernard, welcome back. He had a couple of missed tackles, but he was playing very aggressive, and you could tell maybe he was being a little bit mindful of the peck and, and not wanting to necessarily like grab and pull. Like If he couldn't wrap and, and bring himself through, you could tell that his technique was a little bit off with tackling. Uh, but the coverage ability is just such a welcome addition to this defense. Uh, the interception was just an unbelievable play where he's carrying a tight end, squeezes, passes off, gets his eyes in the backfield, and, and picks off the ball. I mean, just very difficult play to make, and he was able to do it. Dorian Williams, my goodness, I'm loving what I'm seeing. I just continue to love it. He he, And I'm not a big tackles guy. I don't think it's a very meaningful stat. But he had a game-high 12 tackles, 11 of them being solo. I mean, this dude is processing. He's getting the football. He's a sure tackler, physical, fast. I mean, I love everything about what I'm seeing from Dorian Williams. And he had a great play against a screen play, a tight end screen, uh, reading his keys, got downhill, made a huge tackle. I mean, Dorian Williams is is playing at a level that is very exciting, and I'm, I'm intrigued for how he factors in once Matt Milano's back. I think he's certainly a path to getting three linebackers on the field if you want to do it. Uh, but, you know, you start to think about the way that he's progressing and you're getting used to playing defense without Matt Milano. And there's really not a great opportunity to get out of Matt Milano's deal until after 2025. But Dorian Williams is really emerging, and it's a great thing for this defense. How about Christian Benford? This guy's a stud. This guy is an absolute stud. Uh, what do you give up? One catch for three yards in the game, had a big tackle for loss. He is simply outstanding. and. It's interesting, these these teams are staying away from the Bills' outside corners. They don't, they don't want to throw against Douglas and Benford. And they're picking on Cam Lewis. Cam Lewis was targeted 12 times, gave up 10 catches in this game. That's the guy that they're going after. So I, when Tarrant Johnson gets back, it's going to be good news for the Bills on, on defense. And I think of Stephon Diggs. Like, Stephon Diggs was targeted eight times in this game. Who was he against in coverage? Four times it was Cam Lewis, Terrell Bernard, Dorian Williams, DeMar Hamlin, and Jamarcus Ingram. They're not interested in going after Douglas and Benford. That's a stud pair of corners. So, again, I don't have as much to say on the defense because I think collectively it was very good. Dwayne Carter certainly deserves a shout-out. Had two impact plays in the game, which is a big deal for him in his first start. And I'll say more about the defense as we work through the snap count. So the Bills... 68 snaps on defense. Dwayne Carter, 53%. Daquan Jones, 51%. I thought Daquan Jones played really well. That big fourth and one stop that they had against the run, he blew up the play. Plenty of hustle plays where he was able to get outside and, and run and, and work laterally and make tackles. I thought Daquan Jones had his best game of the year. Zion Logue, 29 game, uh, 29%. I'll tell you what, he looks very ordinary to me. Um, and I think maybe that's a good thing to say that you could come in under these circumstances, play 29% of the snaps on a team that you've been through, been on for just a couple of days, and to look ordinary, that's probably a compliment. And then uh, Branson Dean, uh, 13%. At defensive end, Greg Rousseau, 76%. AJ Epinesa, 69%. Dewan Smoot, 59%. Big time strip sack, was able to convert speed to power play right through Blake Fisher and, and get his arm out and, and strip the ball. Casey Tuhill, 25%. Javon Solomon, 22%. At linebacker, Terrell Bernard, 100%. Dorian Williams, 78%. At corner, Christian Benford, Rasul Douglas, and Cam Lewis all played 100%. At safety, DeMar Hamlin and Cole Bishop, 100%. Jamarcus Ingram, 24%. And Mike Edwards, 1%. I, I certainly have a question about Mike Edwards and if he's a better option than Cole Bishop. I mean, I think it's good that Cole Bishop is playing, also costing the team, which I guess is kind of the deal when you play rookies. You've seen it from all of them at some point <laughs> this year, it feels like. Uh, but Mike Edwards, I don't know what the deal is. Like they, The Bills came out and said the intent during the spring, during OTAs, was for him to be the starter next to Taylor Rapp. He's coming back from shoulder, uh, shoulder injury, and, and he's not available. Then they get to the summer camp, and you know he's supposed to rotate in. With the with Demar Hamlin and Cole Bishop, he gets a hamstring injury and he misses a bunch of time, and he's just not 
getting a chance, but I, I have a hard time believing that he's not a better option than what we've seen from Cole Bishop at this point in time, even if it is good for the long term that Cole Bishop is kind of getting a chance to fail forward uh, right now. Studs and duds. Uh, people put a lot into my studs and duds, and I appreciate that. It's always fun. Um, so I'll give them to you. But as far as the criteria, I just I kind of spitball, to be honest with you. At the end of my prep, I say, okay, who are the studs and duds? And I write down names. So I always I feels like I I put a lot into this episode, and the thing that I get the most feedback is this little footnote at the end where I give you my studs and duds, where it's like, hey, we had really meaningful conversations about all these other things and who I choose and not to choose as studs and duds is always interesting to me to see the feedback that I get. So here's what I have. Studs, Dewan Smoot made a game-changing play that gave the Bills a chance to win a game. Dwayne Carter, first start, you made a major impact. Daquan Jones, welcome to the party. Christian Benford, you're a stud. You're an elite corner in the NFL. Dorian Williams, I love watching you play football. Terrell Bernard, welcome back. You made a game-changing play. And uh, you, you, the defense was better because you were out there. Duds, Cole Bishop, Josh Allen, Joe Brady, Sean McDermott. I mean, maybe you could include MVS. What do you expect from the fifth receiver? Maybe you could include Keon Coleman, although, I mean, that touchdown was a big deal in the game. I thought some of the other stuff was pretty poor, but I'm just trying to be mindful of, like, David Edwards had a big whiff, but overall he was good. Osiris Torrance got worked back on a, on a key play, but I thought overall he was pretty good, so... I try not to make it about like one moment. Like, did you have one bad moment or were you consistently a problem for the team? And so Cole Bishop, Josh Allen, Joe Brady, Sean McDermott. And I guess I'll put in Keon Coleman because he, an MVS. I don't know. See what I mean? You can pick whatever you want, guys. All right. That's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. As always, I appreciate you being here. Next up, we'll get to herd mentality. Looking forward to diving into a bunch of outstanding questions that have already been sent in. And then we'll start getting ready for the Jets on Monday Night Football. As always, I kindly ask that you share, subscribe, rate, and review. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills! I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.